Hey everybody, welcome to this week's Q&A. It is probably the last nice day that I'll be able to leave all the windows open while I'm recording this, so it might be a little bit noisier, but I'll try to filter it out because it's just a beautiful day and it's been crap here for the past couple of weeks. But anyway, let's jump in and check out the questions from this week. First up, over on the YouTube subscription service, Chad Wolf said they noticed Voltar teased a potential upgrade for video quality on non-one-chip SNES models. Anything I could share with you on this? It's something they've been excited about, but never seems to materialize. Well, the first thing I could share with you is everything Zach teases sometimes comes out and sometimes doesn't. And I love the dude. He's a really good friend of mine. But when, when Zach talks about projects that are coming soon... Some of them show up in a couple of weeks, some of them show up in a couple of years, so don't hold your breath for any of that. But I will share a very quick overview of bypasses, because there's always some misinformation out there. I don't think it's intentional, but basically, if you have any of the originals look, the fat SNESs, and you open them up, and you see a motherboard revision one chip, dash one, dash two, dash three, it looks phenomenal. There's nothing you should that you have to do to it. You could do a bypass for a little bit of improvement, and depending on the motherboard, sometimes it's an improvement, and other times it'll probably look about the same. Then on the SNES minis, none of those connections are there. So you need to do some kind of mod to restore or add RGB and S video functionality. And the amped versions will give you a slightly better picture, but any way of restoring that is fine, as long as the mod work is done right. However, on the two PPU version, that's another thing is people get mad when I say two chip. There are two PPU chips. So te technically it is a two chip SNES, but uh, for whatever reason, those, you can do different types of bypasses to it, but they're never consistent, at, uh, at least up until recently. There's a prototype floating around of something where you have to remove both of those PPUs, put them onto this prototype board, put that in its place, and program an FPGA on it. And that looks freaking awesome. Uh, but the project's not finished. You can't get the FPGAs anymore. We're probably still a year out before you could even get that. And then there's a bunch of other bypass projects that range from only really amplifying the noise, so you get it sharper, but then all you see is the noise, to ones that do look pretty good most of the time. And then sometimes you load it up and it looks worse. So while there are a bunch out there that you, if you are a nerd that loves tinkering, you could absolutely try this and just make sure to do it in a way where you could put it back to the way it was if you don't like it, or basically when you realize that it's not the end all be all mod for it. Absolutely. Maybe you'll learn something. Maybe you'll discover something that'll help everybody else. But if you're just somebody looking or waiting to take the original SNESs, which there's a bunch of motherboard revisions, and some are always going to look worse than others. There's almost nothing you could do about that. But there are things coming uh, relatively easy all the way up to really complicated install. And as soon as it's released, I'll make a big deal about it because the SNES is my favorite console. I don't care how busy I am. I'll drop what I'm doing to, to do that. So with all of the love and respect in the world, if you hear people talking about current two-chip SNES RGB bypasses, so keep that in context of by nerds for nerds. And if somebody tells you it's not, then they don't know what they're talking about. Once again, I mean that with love. I'm not trying to talk down to people, but I got 10 plus years into SNES research and modding. So I think, you know, I'm not trying to sound like a pompous ass, but if, if it's out there and I haven't seen it yet, I would be shocked. So there are things out there. There are things that work, but nothing you could buy today and nothing that you could buy consistently. So just kind of hang on. And I will let everybody know uh, if and when Voltars is released and if it is the solution that many of us hope it could be. James Pingel wants to know how I feel about the analog pocket as an alternative to a Mr. setup. They mostly care about console cores and some arcade cores and probably don't think they're going to mess with the PC stuff. So my opinion on this is pretty cut and dry. If you really prefer handheld gaming, I love it. I thought it was great. I thought the screen was beautiful. Um, the open FPGA platform looks like a bunch of developers are starting to give that a try as well. No guarantee that everything's gonna move over, but if really, if you prefer to game on a handheld, that's awesome. Now, on the flip side of things, if, you, if you're using this only to connect to a TV, or if you're rarely going to use it in handheld mode and you're mostly gonna use it with the dock, I would just go with Mr. It, hands down, zero hesitation on this one because 
While I have always praised Analog's FPGA products for the ability to just plug your cartridges right in, that's not going to be the case for consoles. There's not going to be a giant SNES cartridge adapter for this. If there is, I think it would be hilarious, but it wouldn't make sense to do that, when, especially when you could just load up the cores and load your ROMs in it. So if you're going to be using ROMs anyway, and your priority is to game on a TV, just get a DE10. You can find them. You don't have to go through scalpers. You just got to be a little patient. You got to check the sites. Uh, it's about the same as finding a Raspberry Pi. I would say it's about as easy as finding a commonly in stock Raspberry Pi. I waited months to get a Pi 4 8 gig. I haven't even opened it yet because I forgot why I bought it. <laughs> I finally showed up. And, uh, you know, that that was definitely way harder than getting a DE10. But I, I would honestly just try your best to figure that out. And also check any of the uh, case manufacturers to see, because a lot of times since they buy in bulk, you'll see MrAddons.com have them. You'll see the Retro Castle ones have them. Um, so you just, you know, I know a lot of people don't like AliExpress, but you got to remember, much like eBay, it's all about the seller. So if you, there's plenty of good sellers on both platforms, and they're obviously you know, just a ton of shit sellers too. But so if you want the rest retro castle one and they have DE 10s in stock, don't feel bad that it's AliExpress. That's uh, you know, I've been talking to ivory for a couple of years now. Uh, and as far as which case you want, you don't need any, you could just sit it on your desk. But if you do want a case, I would just suggest whatever, whatever you prefer. I don't think I've found one recently that performs significantly better than the other. So check out all of them. But I'm pretty sure Pork, MrAddons.com, said that they were getting some kind of stock in. So you might want to at least take a look at that. But yeah, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. If you're going for cores that are really only available on the Mr. Project, then that's your answer right there. But on the other side of it, honestly, if you, if you love handheld gaming and you just always want to be playing wherever you carry this thing around... I thought the pocket was great. I don't like handheld gaming, which is preference. You know, it's it's strawberry ice cream versus chocolate ice cream. There's no right answer. I just, I want the smallest phone in the world. I want one of those Zoolander phones and I want the biggest TV and I want to play all my games on that giant TV. So that, that's kind of my opinion on it, but I liked them both. So kind of just do whatever works best for you. Tomochi wanted to chime in on the discussion from last week about removing rust from metal shielding and consoles, and they highly recommend Evaporust for rust removal. It's available at all the big box stores like Home Depot, Lowe's, and it's effective. Just soak the rusted piece in the liquid in whatever container is handy, and any rust will be removed from whatever it is. Then the liquid could be poured back into its original container for future use. The liquid is completely reusable until it looks like it's overburdened with rust, which unless you're cleaning industrial machine parts from Amazon, they're guessing will never happen for retro video game pieces. They would then spray it with rust converter or automotive primer. And then the rust converter is overkill if you used evapor rust, but after priming, you could leave it as is, spray paint it with whatever you want, ruggedize it, but basically just get rid of the rust first. So that's an excellent tip. Uh, thank you very much for um, uh, for passing that along to all of us. I haven't had a chance to try any of that. So, you know, uh, I think it's just a good suggestion and I'll leave it up to everybody listening if they want to try it. And I still want to figure out what that stuff was that people spray on it after removing the rust that's like a clear primer. It might actually just be clear primer. I, I, might, I might be saying exactly what you're saying, but calling it clear primer. So... Uh, thank you very much for the suggestions, and uh, hopefully that might help people who want to try that out. Oliver Clare had a pretty long question involving RF, and I read every single word of this. I promise I actually did. Um, but the gist of it, just in the interest of everybody else's time, is they are looking for a way to distribute RF throughout their house, and they were considering using amplifiers to basically plug in an RF amp into the back of, like, let's say, a, an original NES, and then use that to wirelessly broadcast the RF to their TV. And while I'm sure this would work if you demoed it, and I'm sure it's way safer to do something like that now because almost nobody is using analog TV signals. So it's not like that you would turn this on and then all your neighbors are gonna see your NES playing on their channel three, because that's probably what would have happened if you did this in the 80s or 90s. Um, I wouldn't do it because I've done so much testing with wireless everything from 2005, I mean, in a professional environment, since wireless was released, I've been using it. But since about 2005 till now, especially in like the late 2000s, 
actually no, the, the early 2010s, I did a lot of in-depth research about wireless distribution of video signals, how uh, analog video distribution could be used with digital signals. And it's a really long and boring story that ends. And that's part of what I had to do for my job because we were distributing video throughout a hospital. And every single time I could break it, every time. So just the, the dumbest example, but a good visualization. If you plug in an HDMI, or let's even just say a composite video cable between a game console and a TV, the only way I'm going to break that signal is if I unplug it, uh, unplug the power, unplug the cable, or cut them. That's it. But if you wirelessly send through whatever transmitters or whatever else signal between those two devices, every single time I could make sure that it's terrible interference, doesn't work at all, and by doing that, it's basically recreating scenarios that you might run into. One of the ones that people always used to talk about is run your microwave while transferring a file or something like that. And while it is an example that I've tried to test before, there's just so many factors, natural and digital from stuff that we have in our house that will affect it. Not to mention that I'm not really sure how good it is for a human body to crank up RF frequency uh, amplification and send it wirelessly around you like that. I think those things were really designed for outside use um, to distribute video across neighborhoods, towns, and stuff like that. So I wouldn't mess with any of that wirelessly. I would just wire it all up, mod your consoles, use composite video. Um, I think the time and money spent doing something like that, while amazing for a proof of concept idea, I think if you spent that same time and money, even just composite video modding any of this stuff, uh, and using a standard composite audio switch, or even, I think it would even be cheaper to put an RF demodulator at every single console, switch that to composite and, and RF, or uh, composite video and RCA left and, left and right, most likely just left audio. I think that would even be cheaper and easier to configure than this, and then just run everything through a matrix switch. Um, so, I mean, all are very interesting, interesting ideas. I just really wouldn't mess with it. So. Excellent question, but I, I just think wire it up and that'll probably be a better answer. One more completely unrelated question from Oliver Clare and one more probably disappointing answer. Sorry, my friend. Uh, but they were looking to stream their games while playing them and listening to them through their home theater system. And I've never been able to pull that off without getting Echo. So you get the game audio that you plug directly into uh, into your capture card. And then, of course, your microphone, you get that through the outer speakers. So your listeners will hear an echo of that. I have heard people say that if you get those microphones that are directional, so it almost looks like the gaming headphones with the microphone, but it's only the microphone um, and the ones that go right in front of your mouth. I've heard people say that those are way better because those are designed to pick up volume like an inch away from your mouth. So they don't really pick up as much outer interference because they're, they're kind of the gain is set and the noise reduction, you could kind of set it. So it only activates when you talk, but as you're talking, you might get some of the audio through it as well. So I don't know of a good answer to this. I've never been able to figure one out. The way I always do it is if uh, if you're in OBS, click on wherever the volume slider is, right click on it and hit advanced audio properties. And then under audio monitoring, monitoring hit the drop down and hit monitor and output. And then that way you could monitor the game audio through your headset and just have no audio going on in the room. There's a bit of a delay doing it that way. Uh, how long it depends on your audio interface, but I think it's a good trade off for streaming. But if anybody has any other options that they know would work or especially guides to follow, please let us know. Cause that, I mean, I would love to be able to play like Sam Miller's uh, Super Metroid soundtrack with the volume cranked and be on stream, but not cranked like deafening, but like, so you could feel the game, but I don't think there's any way that's possible. I, I don't think there's any way I'd be able to talk and be able to hear the volume that well. So sorry about that, but hopefully people in the chat would be able to help. The Pask has a question about PVM calibration that I think is probably a better question for Steve from RetroTech, but I'm gonna try to at least offer some insight, but I, I, I'm not the best at this stuff because I don't do it nearly as often. But Pask finally got a PVM and Every time they switch between consoles, which is a very wide variety of NES all the way up to Xbox 360, running into it via, obviously, analog 480i, but 
every time they go into the menu and change the settings so that everything's centered, when they turn it off and back on again, all of those settings are lost. So do they have to save every individual change, then power off and go back? Is there a global setting? Um, are there different settings for four by three and widescreen? And to be perfectly honest, I, I don't know. When it comes to BVMs, I've messed with that a lot because their on-screen menus and their controller boards are very easy to, to use. So normally I get it mostly calibrated and then I just manually, when I switch between consoles, when it's a game that I like, I'll just go into the BVMs menu and just reset the horizontal and vertical size and position. That's it. So 30 seconds worth of work tops like start to finish maybe a minute from the time you load up the 240p test suite to the time it's all configured and that I'll do, but I'll do that every time I'm, you know, like if I'm like, Oh, let me test out this new Mr. Core. No. But if it's like, okay, I'm, I want to play a game now. I'm going to get everything set up, turn on my stereo. Yeah. I'll take the minute or two to do that. But if you're messing with a lot of settings between each, I think something else is the issue. So I don't mean to change your question for you. My apologies for that. But I would worry about getting the PVM calibrated generic, let's just say. So like a four by three image, a four by three, 320 by 240 image. And get that, get that set up, save those settings, and make sure those settings persist. Then afterwards, just worry about horizontal and vertical centering and kind of figure out everything from there. This is also why some of those external centering boxes come in handy, because for PVMs that don't have on-screen displays or for any monitor really that doesn't have H and V knob controls right in front, you have to dig into menus, sitting one of these boxes next to your PVM and just moving horizontal and vertical is a, a pretty big help. Um, but now it's that's also kind of complicated as well because you got to make sure you got the signals are converted to D sub, which is easy, but it just adds a whole lot more components. So if I were you, I would kind of back things up and figure out what exactly is off that you need to change each time and then kind of go from there. But sorry, I couldn't offer too much more advice on this. Raceroni slowly been making the conversion from an RGB SCART setup to a component video one. They were finally going to get the Shinybo 1x2 component video distribution amp to replace their Extron DA2 RGB HV. However, they seem to have been discontinued sometime this year. After trying several odd sellers, they've given up on finding one. Do I have a recommendation for a small component distribution amp for catch capture setup? This will be used to connect a console to both a 14M2U and Datapath E1S. Two options they found so far is a 1x4 amp by Stellar that seems to have less than Stellar reviews and what seems to be like an AliExpress clone of the Shiny Bow. They considered bypassing the amp entirely and just using the output on the 14M2U, but they've also encountered issues with the E1S when they did that for RGBS capture, which is how they ended up with the Xtron in the first place. They know the G-Comp already exists and they'd love one for the living room someday, but they'd prefer something for a slim single game console capture setup for their office. Uh, so you've done all of the research yourself here. Um, I think I'm basically going to just tell you what you already know. So well done. Good nerding. I would first, because it's free, try just passing component through the PVM. I have had issues with that where I had one PVM where one of the, the red connector, I think I needed to disassemble it and just resolder everything because sometimes if you connected an output to red, you'd lose red altogether, but you remove the output and it, you know, it worked fine. So you might have some issues like that only because they're 20 plus year old items. Um, but I would just give it a try. No harm will come of that. So if it works, great. There's your free solution and you don't have to worry about any of this. However, if you do need something, I was actually going to suggest the G-Comp uh, G for all the right reasons, but you said you were looking for something slimmer. So I would get either one of those boxes and see. Um, they're powered, so that's good. That means you could officially distribute them to two sources. There are a few other things that you could use that are made by the community. Voltar, <laughs> Voltar had the double penetration, which was basically all SCART, but you could use those cheap RCA to SCART adapters. Um, and I think there's a few other things like that, where the, it basically uses a THS7374 chip to amplify and buffer the signal from one in to two out. So you could find those, but I would definitely just start with the free solution at first and see what happens. And also be patient with the E1S. What I've found that going direct with component video, sometimes it takes a minute. 
And I know that sounds weird, but like I'll be connecting a console with RGB, uh, RGB SCART converted to the correct signal going direct in and switching between consoles, the data path picks up right away. But the moment that same signal is switched to component video, I get no signal for a few moments and then I mess around with the settings and poof, everything starts working again. So I don't know why. A couple of people have said that's weird, but it's happened on 10 different data path vision cards on 15 different PCs. So whatever. But yeah, I would just start with the free solution first and then kind of just go from there. But the Amazon ones are cheap. They're in stock and available and you could always return them. So if you decide that you need a powered solution, I would grab one of those first and just make sure it doesn't hurt the video quality. Next up, Sal really wants to mod their Dreamcast, but they're worried that new products are right around the corner and they're not sure whether to do it now or to wait. Uh, my advice on this is almost always the same in that I always tell people, if you want something right now, buy whatever's out there. Now that we're deep into a global part shortage, that advice is the same, but really emphatically trying to make the point that you might not get the next thing coming because it might not happen. So anything you want that's available now that is good enough for your needs, do it. Or if you were like, hey, my setup is totally fine as is. I don't really need any of this, but it looked kind of cool then maybe wait. But if it's something that you know that you want, like an HDMI mod and an ODE, then just go for it. The other thing too is while these consoles are still not as expensive as they might be as they get older and rarer, what you might want to do is what my original plan was before my whole setup started to change in that I have the Sega Sports Edition Black Dreamcast with a match, bl matching black controller that my idea was to keep that 100% stock because it's in mint condition, mint-ish. I think there's like one tiny little scratch on it, but and it's original and I, you know, I can appreciate everything the dream that the Dreamcast was right from there and then have a second one that's fully modded and um, I, none of that's happening. I'm actually trading off a lot of my collection to get more stuff to test because I do way more testing than gaming. So having a, a mint condition original console is the opposite of what I should be doing for this. But that might, might, might be a really good idea for you. Find like your dream Dreamcast and get that and use the original discs and then have another one, maybe a yellowed beat up one with a cracked case or something like that. And look for the clear shells, look for any ODE that you might want and, and kind of go from there. Now, the, you did have a few other specific questions. Um, they were looking into the DC digital mod. I think that's awesome. I love that mod. Uh, Pixel FX did say they were trying to get another version of that out uh, that out this year, I believe, but part shortage, who knows? So you might want to just double check with them on social media or something. But if there's no imminent release date for that, there's zero issues with version one. It works absolutely awesome. It just, you might not get some of the extras from version two that who knows when that's coming out. And once again, that is not a dig against Pixel FX or any company today. There is a part shortage. So something that should have, you know, if you have a group of parts shipping to you today, until they get on that truck and arrive to you, there's no guarantee that they shipped you the right parts that they actually shipped. I mean, it's, it's brutal lately. And as far as optical drive emulators, one thing that Sal wanted that I also want is the ability to keep the original drive and have a way to load ROMs on it that way. And that does not exist easily for the Dreamcast. I know there was a few things out there that you can, but it's a complicated install. I believe Modsville USA was looking into a newer version of one of those, but I didn't really hear anything. So I'm assuming it, it wasn't that great, or maybe there were software issues or something like that. But here's another, another excuse to say, maybe I do want one mint original rare console and then one with an ODE in it. So. I'm going to leave all of those things up to you. I just wanted to add some uh, some perspective on that, especially my my very strong suggestion of if you want something that's out now, just get it. And if something comes out tomorrow, that's life, right? But I mean, we all know this is going to happen. If you buy a, a 2022 Honda Civic, you know, in 23, there's going to be different options and different stuff. It's just it's part of life, right? Um, but yeah, hopefully I was able to help at least f a little bit. Steve Wells wanted to chime in on the conversation from last week about is it okay to rem remove certain metal shielding? And Steve said you can't remove the upper internal shielding from the Dreamcast, 
as it acts as a heat sink for the main ICs. Thank you. I knew there was something about the Dreamcast that I wasn't remembering. I just couldn't visualize it. So much appre uh, appreciated chiming in. Um, I think hopefully most people would be able to take it apart and see it and understand, but I wanted to mention it anyway. So thank you, Steve. Hayden Brown said, as an outsider to the analog product line, it seems like the pocket has exploded in popularity relative to their other devices, spawning a booming development scene and community. This seems somewhat at odds with the high-end exclusive boutique style of the company. What are my thoughts on this development, and do I think this will impact their product design philosophy going forward? That is a really awesome question, and this is going to be an interesting one to answer because my tech knowledge and manufacturing knowledge on this are, are really rooted in fact, but my opinions on boutique companies are, are more opinions, and I don't really know what I'm talking about. So consider this one ha half half fact, I guess. Um, but it's interesting because analog looks and acts like a boutique company, which is like, imagine you get really nice sunglasses for 50 bucks, or you could buy like Chanel ones for 200. It's the same exact sunglass pretty much, but you want that higher end one you want, or some people at least want to feel the luxury of having that logo and Analog absolutely acts like that, but their prices aren't crazy. I've always praised them for that, except for the NT Mini. No one, no one asked for that aluminum shell, an extra hundred dollar price point. But still, their other, you know, the Super NT and Mega SG, and their other products too, the Pocket and the announced but not released Duo. Those all were probably. I don't know if they announced the price in the Duo, but anyway, the other three had very fair prices. It would be cool if they were cheaper. I think they would sell more, but. It's kind of interesting because that wasn't a jacked up price like you would see with most boutique products. So what they do next is really interesting, and I'm not really sure how it will affect their marketing and the way they approach all of the, the uh, their products and their culture around it. But what I would like to see is a mainstream product priced as best as possible. So a $200, I, I'm using this as an example, not literally, but imagine if analog built the Retron 5. So rather than shitty stolen emulation, it was their FPGA cores, but it had a cartridge for each for each one. It had a bunch of controller ports on the outside. And that was a $200 product that people could buy, use their original cartridges and use open FPGA. I think I would call that a mainstream product. I mean, $99 would be amazing. You would completely open up a wildly different market, but I don't know if that's actually possible based on a lot of things. You know, even just part cost, I don't think that's possible. But something like that would be a great mainstream product. And then Analog could do individual versions, and they're all aluminum cases for jacked up boutique prices. And then you'd have the bottom of the barrel garbage hyperkin system on a chip with a terrible scaler stuck to the back of it consoles. Not all of them are that bad, but most of them are. So I don't know. I, they have a bunch of different choices because if they make a mainstream product, how are they going to market it? How are, are they going to go through other distribution where they spin off a different company name? I think that's usually what's most common is they spin off companies, spin off either a higher end product line, like, you know, Acura to Honda or a lower end product line like Scion to Toyota. I think I'm making that. I think I'm getting that right. But so it, it, it's a really interesting discussion and it's kind of interesting to think about. And I just hope, you know, I hope they do what's right for everybody. I, I really truly believe that because there aren't excellent alternatives for your cartridges, that there's room to have both uh, a really cool, fairly priced, as cheap as possible, uh, you know, hopefully FPGA solution. And I also hope that there's, I know there's room for higher end, more expensive ones for the people that that matters to. The same people that would buy the Chanel sunglasses versus the one at the, you know, on a shelf somewhere else. So, I don't know. It's a great question. I would love to. I would love to have a discussion with Chris Tabor about it, but he doesn't do interviews like that, and I, I doubt he would want to have a conversation with me because I am the only person that doesn't just drop to my knees and worship him when he does these press releases. So I think I would probably be the last person he would ever want to do an in-person interview or you know over over chat interview with. But I would love to, and I would love to have this conversation and ask where his mindset is and what's coming next and what to expect because I just I truly think there's room. For for both. We already have the cheap junk that I would love to see people not buy, but they're going to, and there really isn't a middle ground, and a lot of the higher end stuff you can't even get. So, good question. 
Mr. Bildo wants to do some kind of Game Boy Advance console conversion, but they're not sure what the best available solution is right now. Um, so there's a couple of things that I'm going to assume. I'm going to assume you're talking about taking an actual Game Boy Advance and making that into a console and not any of the alternatives. And you want to do it right now today. My answer to that would be whatever you can get. I think that Woozle's Game Boy Advance consoleizer is still the best one out there, but it's been notoriously impossible to get. And it's not cheap, but I, I think it performs really well. There are other alternatives out there. The Game Box Systems one, the Composite Video Output one. Um, there's a, Just don't get the Intec Gaming one. That one's total garbage. But all of the rest of those seemed like very good solutions. And it really is comes down to... Are they available? How much do they cost? And what are the features? So if you want to mostly play in your Game Boy Advance, but also plug into a CRT, the, the one that, uh, that I believe Macho Nacho Productions, Tito did a video on that. That seems kind of neat. Uh, not too expensive either. If you wanted a, more of a console feel to it, the Game Box Systems is uh, making one. There's a, at least one open source project that you could make yourself. I believe people were trying to get a run of production, but you know, FPGA is part shortage, all that stuff. But I, I still think if you're asking only what's the best Game Boy Advance consoleizer, I think Woozles still is. I think it's the lowest latency and, and works the best, but the others are, except the Intec, are not bad. And I think the availability of them. So if you're asking what can I actually buy today, I think it's going to be one of the others, but they're not bad solutions. So I'm just trying to keep all that into perspective. So if I were you and I wanted to take a Game Boy Advance motherboard and make it into a console, I would research whatever you can buy that will ship today or relatively today and pick up that one as long as it's in your price range and has the features you want. Josh Lopez recently graduated from an electronics technician program that helped them get their feet wet with coding, soldering, PCB troubleshooting, and ladder logic. Now that they're out and looking for a job, they're unsure which electronics niche to dive into. They know I've mentioned I have experience working in similar fields and we're wondering if I might have any suggestions on where a budding technician who has an affinity for video games might want to start looking. Just thought to pick my brain a little bit so myself and or themselves and other people going down the same path could get some pointers. Um, I am the worst person to ask this question. I have done so much good work. I've worked my butt off. I've worked at great companies and I am shit at marketing myself and finding jobs. The last time I went out and got a three month job, uh, just took a three month assignment on something. I didn't even know how to explain what I did correctly, let alone talk to the right people and get the right job for me. So I am absolutely the worst. I, I think what you would probably want to do is just start looking around to see what jobs are available, what the pay structure is and who is looking for entry level and kind of just go from there. But I mean, maybe, maybe do the exact opposite of what I'm telling you. Cause I got, I definitely have no skills for job hunting and very bad luck with all of this. Well, I shouldn't say that I've landed some dream jobs before and I just still have no idea how. I just I, I talked to a couple of recruiters who don't give a shit about me or my skills or what I could do. They just want to get their commission. And a couple of times, one has accidentally put me in the right place. I actually think I got my dream job by accident because a couple of months after I got it, they kept mentioning mentioning Dave. I'm making up a name here. I'm like, I I'm sorry, I have no idea who Dave is. And they're like, that was your recruiter. I'm like, no, no, it wasn't. This is the person I've been talking to. I never talked to a Dave. So I think somebody sent me, I think somebody spent such little attention to me that they sent me to a job interview, the wrong person to the wrong job interview, but I got the job. It was my dream job at the time and uh, learned so much. It's how I got to travel the world, learn about manufacturing and stuff like that. And I think that might've just been luck. So, you know, I earned my place after I got there, but getting myself there was always, always the worst at it. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm so sorry to skirt this answer and not have any good suggestions, but I, I just historically have been absolute garbage at finding jobs and, and, fi and getting into the right place. It's, it's usually been luck and then followed by hard work to keep me there. But yeah, sorry. Sure, sure. Steinholm has a couple of questions. I am going to answer these out of order. Uh, for reasons that you'll figure out in a second. First, they have a leftover PC that they want to use for RetroNAS. Do they have any tips on configuring it? Uh, 
So software is very, very straightforward and it's not much different than the original video I did. And in fact, I think you could just do that now and then uh, any other, any changes will just be visual. The installation process is pretty much the exact same. And if you're okay typing into a command line, then you could, you could always do it that way anyway. And remember, command lines only for installation, you'd be able to use it in other ways afterwards. So um, tips on configuring it is first of all, just follow the instructions and get it running. But tips on hardware configuration, I do have a few. First of all, strongly, strongly recommend that you're using a gigabit ethernet port. So if your PC doesn't have one, then I would definitely pick one up and install it. I've, I've did a couple experiments, which I gave all the laptops away because I didn't have time to do the video, but I did a bunch of experiments using old beat up laptops as retro NASes, and they all worked fine. And on top of that, one of the ones that only had a 10100 ethernet port, but it had USB 3, I was able to use a USB 3 gigabit ethernet adapter and got much higher speeds than off the 10100. So get yourself gigabit ethernet one way or the other. Uh, and that's really the number one thing. And then the number two is hard drive. Um, do you need a lot of space? Then obviously a mechanical spinning drive is going to be the best bet. You, if your motherboard supports RAID, you could buy two, run them in RAID zero and, and get a little bit of a speed increase. If you're more about the convenience of a retro NAS and speed would be a benefit, grab a couple of SSDs, especially if you could run those in RAID, that would be better. But that's that's the basis of it is get yourself something with a gigabit ethernet and decide what's more important to you, size or speed. But now on to your other questions, which will lead directly back to this. Um, they just got some free McBoot memory cards for their three PlayStation 2s. And they were wondering if it's possible to load the same game on all of them simultaneously from the same SMB share in RetroNAS. You're going to have to test that yourself. But assuming that you're using a gigabit Ethernet and a not crappy hard drive, and I just mean not like a 20 year old hard drive, I would try two things. I would try doing that. And if that didn't work, I would try copying and making three copies of the same file. So, you know, uh, game A, game B, game C, but it's just the same ISO and each PlayStation access a separate one. That might help if the first way doesn't work. And then if you're using a mechanical hard drive, maybe try switching it to a, a SSD to see if that would work. But there's no technical limitation for that because the maximum speed you're going to get streaming to a PlayStation 2 is much slower than a gigabit ethernet port and your average speed of a decent hard drive. So I think, I think you might be able to do that. I, the only hesitation might be if it's the same file, is there going to be some kind of, uh, especially with a mechanical hard drive, is there going to be some kind of issue with that? But I would just give it a try. It's not going to hurt anything. And please let us know if it's possible because that's kind of cool. And lastly, is there any way to load save files on a PS2 from RetroNAS? I don't think so, but there's been a whole bunch of updates and virtual memory cards and how those are handled and uh, how you could use uh, any of the software for PS2 to kind of manipulate those. So you would have to do a little bit more, uh, more research on that, but I don't think it's directly integrated into RetroNAS yet, but one of those other pieces of software might be able to allow you to transfer them over the network and then you just point it to RetroNAS. So great questions. Let us know how you made out. Adam Adamant has a question about mods and solder. They don't have an issue with soldering leaded or lead free. They can do either with ease. The question is if there's a reliable source that tells me which solder was used on the console boards. They know a good portion of the world has been has banned leaded solder over the past few years. But what about our consoles pre 2001? They know the GameCube has been lead free because they happen to see an install video from Citrus 3000. They know sometimes it's unavoidable, but they'd prefer not to mix the chemistries. Um, so that's an interesting question, and I don't know if that's something to worry about in the context of what we do. Um, maybe I'm the wrong person to ask then, but whenever I've discussed this in the past, uh, in fact, discussed this at length, uh, we talked about different techniques. Voltar and I have been going back and forth about this for years, but not once has anybody said, hey, if you're desoldering something, when you put it back, make sure to use leaded solder instead of unleaded. Uh, I think... I don't think it's something we have to worry about with the mods that we do. Now, there are some things that for very advanced mods that you might want to worry about that, like removing chips, like BGA socketed or non-socketed chips and replacing them. That might be 
a much bigger deal. But if you're talking about replacing capacitors, doing these basic video mods, I don't really think that makes a difference. But I'd love to hear anybody's opinion. And as always, if I'm wrong, I'll be the first to wave my arms in the air and apologize. But I just, in all of the years of talking to some of the best modders on the planet, no one has ever said, and by the way, if you replace this cap, make sure to use no lead or, or lead solder. So I, I don't really, I don't know if that's something they just forgot to mention or if it's not as big a deal for the stuff that we're normally doing, but please correct me if I'm wrong. A couple of questions from Oliver Claire about the Project Stellar Xbox mod and the Behar Brothers Exodusa. So first, they know that Make Megahertz confirmed Project Stellar will work without the HDMI mod if users want to have some features of Stellar on an Xbox with analog video out. But do we know yet which Stellar features require the Xbox HD Plus to work? I would assume a lot of the features that allow you to access video menus when the Xbox is still even booting. Because uh, that was one of the things I saw in the demo is the Xbox logo was starting up, but there was still something on the screen. I don't think that's possible at all without an HDMI mod. So OSD stuff, um, I don't know about anything else though. So you'd have to ask Dustin that one. Next, is it possible that some of Stellar's Xbox HD Plus exclusive features could be enabled by using the HDMI output on a device like the Exodusa or Chimeric or piece of crap garbage cable you get from eBay or Amazon? No, definitely not because uh, or, or if the answer was yes, it would be way more complicated than just installing the HDMI mod. You would have to figure out a way to interface directly with that HDMI chip. Uh, if they were to stick with the Exodusa, how easy is, it, is the process of raising or lowering the brightness in order to fix the darkness issue? I don't know, and I, I, my, my nerdiness wanted so badly to start replacing components and test but I had to draw a line. And I know this is a pompous thing to say, and I know people are gonna probably get annoyed, but I need to pick and choose where I spend my time. I'm out of it, zero. I haven't picked up that brand new beautiful guitar since that live stream. So this product is already out. They didn't send me a pre-production unit. I didn't get a beta to test. It's already out, people already have the issue. So there's not much I can do other than try to research and make a guide for people on how to fix it. Isn't that kind of up to the Behar brothers to do? It would be different if they sent me a prototype. And, I, and I'm not saying that you should send me prototypes. I'm just saying if the timeline was different and they said, here's some hand soldered prototypes, what do you think? And I, I said, hey, change this one resistor or do this or do that. Cool. I would gla be glad to help any kind of indie developer. I'm always going to help as much as I can. Any company, you're going to pay me because I'm not stupid. Uh, but if it's already out in the wild, I, I don't know. I think there's smarter people than me that have the ability to test, that have a little bit extra time than I do that might be able to make a guide and hopefully put it up on the wiki. So um, my my apologies, I'm not gonna be messing with the Exodus anymore. If somebody comes out with a fix for it, that's easy. I will certainly confirm it, but there, there, were only other, there was only one other thing I wanted to verify on it and that was audio related anyway. Uh, and the only other thing that Oliver was talking about was light guns through the Xbox HD Plus via an HDMI to component video converter. Matt from Video Game Perfections did a test on that a while back and said it mostly worked, except the games that required you to be in 15 kilohertz mode. And that is not available from the Xbox HD Plus. So they would have to add 480i output to that. But even then, I'm not sure if that's a limitation just because they didn't want a bunch of people complaining that it wasn't working on a computer monitor or if there is some kind of sync thing where it has to be exact to a CRT. I'm not 100% sure about that, but that's it's something that if 480i support is ever added to the Xbox HD Plus might be worth considering. So um, hopefully I, I got all those questions right, but please let me know if I, uh, if I missed anything. Jason Guffey was trying to modify a Rad 2X to work kind of like an original RetroTINK 2X or 2X Mini, and there seemed to be having some sync issues. I read through the entire question, and I read through all of the different things you're describing, and I think this is one of those rare cases, and I think this might be the only time I've ever said this on a Q&A, but I don't think you should waste any more time on this at all. I love nerding. I love doing things for the purpose of experimentation, but what you're doing is taking a device that's designed for a very specific set of inputs and trying to turn it into a generic device where you could probably just put that thing back together, put it back in its case, sell it on eBay, buy an original RetroTINK 2X for the same price or less, 
and you, you have exactly what you're trying to accomplish already in front of you. And on the flip side, somebody gets to buy a Rad 2X um, for its intended use, just plug in and don't forget about it. And I'm, I'm sorry to, to be discouraging about this one, but there's so many different sync issues you might run into. And also how the RetroTink uh, or the Rad 2X products work, or they, I think most of them convert RGB to component and then line double. So you're dealing with a lot of circuitry in there that is not designed to be running through the things that you're plugging it into. So while it probably is fixable, I mean, this might involve this might involve breaking out a scope, trying to analyze the signals, trying to figure out where the changes are made. Maybe you could mod the RAD 2X in a different spot to make it, but it all comes down to, this is gonna be a lot of time and effort when you could probably spend five minutes throwing it up on eBay. After it sells, pick yourself up a used, just regular old RetroTINK 2X and you're back to the same exact spot. So if I'm being an old grump, let me know. If this is more of a nerd experiment that you're looking for the answers of sync issues and just using the RAD 2X as a test device, we'll jump back into it. But if you're just looking to do this to solve problems, I think you're solving the wrong problem. And I obviously mean that with love and respect. Uh, I just, part of my job here is to try to make things easier for everybody else. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do with this answer. But if I got it wrong, let me know and we'll jump back in. One more from Jason. They've been streaming a lot of older anime from Crunchyroll, but their source upload quality is terrible. There's deinterlacing artifacts, color banding, and general compression noise everywhere. And the only resolution op options they think are 140, 360, and 480p. Do I have any suggestions for what they might do to help the show and possibly other shows they run into with these problems? Is it possible to run it through an upscaler and then rescale it back with various video processors? So here's something that many people have probably run into with older content in that, first of all, if the original content was 480i and there's no interlaced way of streaming it, then you're relying on whatever that company's deinterlacing method is. And on top of all of that, if there's multiple resolution options and tons of compression, you there might be no way to fix this at all. You uh, and in fact, rescaling it wouldn't really help. What might help if you're using flat panels, you could try setting it to 480p, uh, outputting in component video. So maybe if it's HDMI, use a, a DAC for that. And then adding scan lines with your RetroTank 5X, that might cut through the image and trick your brain into thinking a lot of the artifacts are just, oh, it's, you know, this is my CRT look or something. It's not going to actually improve the video. It would just trick your brain into perceiving it differently. And in the same respect, watching it on a CRT is definitely another good way to try to trick your brain into just into replacing the old analog video artifacts that would have you probably would have seen back in the day with compression artifacts, but being drawn with the CRT, which is much more forgiving. This is also the perfect excuse to use one of those crappy, cheap HDMI to composite converters. While they're laggy and terrible for gaming, they're perfect for this. <laughs> Absolutely what they were intended for. And they're cheap and you don't have to run a bunch of different things into each other. They work really well. So that might be something that you want to look into. And that's the only other tip, I guess, would be if you have two CRTs to choose from, a 36 inch and a 13, try it on the 13. And just having a smaller picture the lines, the TVL closer together, drawn with a CRT might be a good way to improve it. But if these are things that are really important to you, you're probably going to want to hunt down the original source. So VHS tape, DVDs, whatever you can. And if not, if this is good enough, hey, maybe that, that's going to be a good enough answer for you. But definitely a great question. Belmont just got a Voltar SNES mod chip and a SCART cable attenuated with a 330 ohm resistor on the C-Sync line. Would they need to solder both pads on the TTL jumper since the cable has a resistor? Um, so if you're talking about a Voltar board that's been purchased in the last three years, probably more than that, it doesn't matter anymore um, because he was able to shape that signal in a way where it should just work no matter what your cable configuration is. However, I have a very strong opinion about this. I think that all, especially SNES cables, should always be built to original configuration and uh, original spec. And I think that every console, modded or not, should have the same exact signals coming out of it. Because inevitably, somebody else is going to run into these consoles at some point. Or you're going to forget which ones were modded with what at some point. 
And I don't ever want to have somebody worry about plugging in the right cable into the right connector. If it's, if it's a well-built cable and a, a well-modded console, they should match. So I would just make sure that it's set so it is outputting TTL level of voltage uh, on the board because that's what the original SNES outputted and go from there. Um, it, it won't really affect your performance, but as far as you never have to worry about it again, I think that's very important because your cable's fine either way, the board's fine either way, so you might as well make it so that you never have to worry about who plugs what into it. So definitely a good question, but I... I, I would I think stock? I think it. I could be wrong. Please double check. But I I think and I hope Voltar is shipping those out so they output TTL level by default or a way or a voltage that's kind of halfway in between. So it really wouldn't matter. But I would double check. But I don't I don't think you have anything to worry about. I think you could just plug it in, solder it up, and go and not have to touch the cable all at all. Also, welcome. Uh, you know, I saw this was your first question. So uh, good one. Uh, good one to start with. Seacon wants to know if I have any thoughts on other reliable VGA to SCART sync combining solutions if they're not able to get the HD15 to SCART from Castlemania. They're looking to connect a PC or Mr. to their 15 kilohertz only Sony, P Sony PVM or BVM, and they've scared me away from combining syncs with the Y splitter. Uh, probably be okay with a PVM or BVM, but do you really want to take that chance? So I'm kind of glad I scared you away from it. I certainly don't. Maybe for like a second, just to power up and test something real quick, but that's it. Uh, but the VGA to SCART from retroupdates.co.uk looks like a decent op option, but they know nothing about the company. Um, I I've talked to the person who runs that a bunch of times. They seem awesome. I've used, uh, I think I've tested a box similar to that from them before. It seems completely safe. The only difference is that is a powered solution versus a not powered solution, but the powered ones might increase compatibility if you have a, a weird BVM that doesn't like sync issues. So my suggestion would be either try to build your own HD15 to SCART if you have a 3D printer and you know, you, uh, I think the designs are out there. I gotta double check on that. But if you're just looking to buy something, then the one from Retro Upgrade should be totally fine and should do the exact same thing. Just, it, it probably will require power. I could be wrong, but if not, hey, that, then there you go. It should be basically the same thing. Well, that's it for this time. If you're new to these Q&As, ask any question you'd like wherever it is that you support in the newest Q&A post. The way these services work, I can never figure out what's a new question on an older post. Plus, as you saw today, I like just loading up each of the support services, scrolling through and reading them in real time, just kind of like we were sitting hanging out somewhere. So uh, any question you have, just ask wherever it is that you support. And if for whatever reason I miss it, it either just came in after I was done recording or I made some stupid mistake in post. So if you need anything, DM me. But as always, thank you for everything. Thank you for your support. And I'll see you next week.